Okay, so I'm now going to introduce Belle. Let's get right in there and give Belle as long as we can to talk about her study. So Belle is an Australian registered nurse and midwife, and she's currently completing her PhD with the Susan Wackel School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Sydney. Belle has qualifications in midwifery, nursing and paramedicine, and has over 15 years clinical experience in a variety of hospital and community settings. Belle's research explores the administration of intravenous fluids to women in labour, applying knowledge from her emergency, trauma and critical care experience to examine this contemporary clinical practice. Belle has a passion for research, education, patient safety and the implementation of evidence-based care. And Belle won't be on the screen, she's going to be just using her audio today, so she won't have her video going. And so welcome Belle. Thank you, Hazel. G'day everyone. It's great to be joining you from Sydney, Australia. Today I am here to talk to you about my PhD research that explores the administration of IV fluids to women um, during labour and birth. Before Sorry, I begin, no, no, no. that's okay. I fix it. Yeah. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, traditional custodian, custodians of the land on which the University of Sydney campuses stand, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So, IV fluids and labour. This research was born through my confusion and curiosity. I've had the great opportunity through my career to experience a wide variety of clinical areas and learning. I started out my health education in paramedicine before moving into nursing and later midwifery. While most of my education was completed in Australia, my initial maternity education was at Georgetown University in Washington DC during a semester abroad. As a nurse in Australia, you would have mostly found me in an emergency department. However, I have rotated for many specialties and health settings. My background is important as it helps shape my view and understanding of IV fluids. Coming from a background where IV fluids were encouraged to be strictly monitored and used with caution, I did not find the same when I moved into midwifery. Here I saw IV fluids administered more freely and for indications that when I asked, no one could really provide an answer. Today's presentation will focus on the first two stages of my PhD. The first stage being a retrospective clinical chart review and fill balance documentation audit, and the second, a qualitative interviews with midwives across Australia. Before moving into the studies, I just want to provide a little bit of background about what we currently know about IV fluids. Firstly, it is quite a common intervention here in Australia. It can be estimated that over half of all women who birth in Australian hospitals will receive IV fluids at some point during their labour and birth. Reasons women may receive IV fluids um, can include administration of medications such as IV oxytocin um, for a preload prior to epidural analgesia to manage signs of fetal distress, um, as well as maternal hydration and for emergency situations such as sepsis and postpartum hemorrhage. However, at present, our practices in Australia are largely undescribed. Also, as an offshoot of this, we, we also don't know what effect our current practice has on women and their babies. This is important because there are recognised risks of IV fluid administration, for example, infection, fluid overload, electrolyte disturbance, and neonatal transient tachnia. Additionally, recent re research also questions whether IV fluid administration can influence neonatal birth weights and breastfeeding. With this in mind, the, the first step of my part of my PhD was to perform a retrospective clinical chart, chart review and fluid balance audit to help gain a bit more understanding about how IV fluids were currently being used. The aim of the study was to describe the current practice of registered midwives administering IV fluids to women during labour. And the primary objective was to determine the level of a completion of New South Wales State standardised fluid balance documentation, of which I provided examples in the pictures below. The review included IV fluid orders, fluid balance charts, clinical progress notes, and the labour partogram. Charts included in the study were those of first-time mothers who presented the birth unit in documented spontaneous labour with one baby in a head-down position and who had received IV fluids during labour. The sample included 107 first-time mothers. The median maternal age was 33 years and the median gestational age was 40 weeks. The study took place at a Metropolitan Tertiary Referrable Hospital in New South Wales, Australia, and was conducted between the 1st of October 2016 to the 22nd of March 2017. For the fluid balance audit, a 24-point audit tool was developed, and this comprised of 12 criteria, of which you'll see in a couple of slides. This graph is showing that the majority of the 107 fluid balance charts scored less than 50% of the total possible score. However, 19 women did not have a chart completed, um, so they were excluded from the audit analysis. 
Um, this was because it was unknown whether a chart was completed and missing or never commenced in the first instance. With this taken into consideration, the lowest score was 3 out of 24 and the highest was 17 out of 24 and the mean score was 10. This table breaks down the results into the 12 criteria that made up the fluid balance chart audit. I would like to bring your attention to the area in blue. This relates specifically to IV fluid input. As you can see from the numbers, the majority of the charts were partially completed when it came to documenting IV fluid input. This made describing the practice challenging. Aspects of the practice I was able to establish included indications for IV fluids, the most common indication being epidural analgesia with concurrent oxytocin infusion, and the second being epidural analgesia on its own. Maternal hydration was an indication for IV fluid use in 20 of the 107 women, with maternal and or fetal con maternal concern the least likely indication to be documented, which was for 11 women or 10%. The type of IV fluids used were the 0.9% normal saline or heart mints, with many re women receiving both. When it came to estimating the volume administered, I was only able to estimate minimal and maximum volumes. The estimated mid medium minimal volume was 2,000 mils, ranging from 500 to 4,000 mils, and the estimated minimal uh, maximal volume was 3,500 mils, ranging from 1,000 mils to just short of six litres. Additionally, an unexpected finding of this study was a low level of IV fluid order completion. 13 charts were excluded for varying reasons, but overall, a low 18% of charts were found to be fully completed. The most common reason for incompletion was no written prescribed order for IV fluids, with 62 of 94 charts found to have IV fluids administered in labour without a written prescribed order. This was recognised to be out of the scope of practice for midwives at this facility. However, the study is limited in its findings to explain as to why this occurred. Following these results, I was left with so many more questions. What did these results mean? What was the reason behind them? I could only envisage that there were multiple interrelated factors at play. So from there, I set out to conduct qualitative interviews with midwives across Australia to see if I could learn more about what midwives think, believe and understand about IV fluids, as well as the documentation relating to them. The aim of the interviews was to examine what influences a midwife to document maternal fluid balance when administering IV fluids to women during labour and birth. The primary objective was to determine barriers and facilitators to documenting maternal fluid balance by midwives. A semi-structured interview schedule consisting of eight open-ended questions with follow-up prompts and probes was developed, and I used the COMB model of behaviour to help guide the development of the interview schedule. The COMB model of behaviour has been widely used to identify what needs to change in order for a behaviour change intervention to be effective. However, however, as it identifies three factors that need to be present for any behaviour to occur, namely capability, opportunity and motivation, I believed it to be a good fit for my needs. The interview questions explored four main areas. Firstly, understanding of indications for IV fluids. Secondly, identification of current practice. Thirdly, benefits and complications of IV fluid administration. And fourthly, barriers and facilitators uh, documentation. Um, face to face telephone face to face telephone and online video calls were offered with thematic analysis used to interpret the data. Eligible participants included registered midwives and postgraduate registered nurse midwifery students. Bachelor midwifery students were not invited as, as they are unable to administer IV fluids independently. However, I did aim to include recent graduates as part of the sample. Participants were primarily recruited for email and social media advertisements. Eligibility was screened by a survey asking for current clinical professional role, midwifery experience and areas of work, i.e. whether they worked in the birth unit or antenatal. 66 registered midwives and three postgraduate registered nurse midwives um, students completed the survey. Um, a maximum variation sampling was was used so I could try and get a variety across Australia for both continuum of care, like different models, so continuum of care um, versus working in birth unit, birth centres, as well as ge geographical location, so metropolitan and rural. Overall, 24 were invited to participate, 10 did not respond, 2 were unable to arrange time, 1 did not attend the scheduled interview, so overall 11 were interviewed. Um, interviews ranged from 24 to 47 minutes, um, and all main states and territories of Australia were representative apart, were represented apart from Tasmania, um, with nine participants from metropolitan, metropolitan areas and two from rural. However, some of the participants did have quite a varied background, um, for example, previous home birth midwife now working in a metropolitan centre. From the analysis, eight major themes were identified, which included six themes relating to understanding influences around IV fluids and two themes specifically around documentation. <laughs> 
The first theme identified awareness of practice. This theme explored reasons for IV fluids. Midwives recognised that IV fluids were commonly used during women's labours and births. The indications midwives spoke about were similar to what I had found in the, in the um, literature review. These include um, induction and augmentation of labour, epidural preload medication administration, fetal, comp fetal compromise and maternal hydration. Additionally, it was recognised that IV fluids were commonly used as a first line um, first line response for many situations, as captured in this quote. When I think about intravenous fluids in labour, I think about, I guess because of my background, I think that's often fairly given ad hoc. If we've got a fetal tachycardia, if we've got the woman looks a bit dry, if she's having an induction, there's always some fluids around. So I feel like fluids is often a first line response for different issues in labour, and I'm always cautious about that. Additionally, this theme also captured variations in clinical practice. For example, factors such as IV fluid type, volume of IV fluids and rate of IV fluids varied between facilities. This also included differing, differing processes for induction of labour. Midwives um, who had pre, um, clinical practice in different facilities also recognised this variation too. The second theme was triggers and habits. This theme identified that midwives believed that the administration of IV fluids and labour had been normalised. How, however, it was recognised as a clinical practice that could be improved, with several midwives reporting that there was a habit of it not being well done. Doubt was expressed over some of the reasons that IV fluids were used, for example, IV fluids for reduced variability of the fetal heart rate. This was reported by one of the nurse midwives from New South Wales who stated, I think it's one of those practices again that we do perhaps to make her feel better in a fearless power situation. Additionally, there was conflicting views whether IV fluids should be used in women with, during normal physiological labour. While some midwives reported that IV fluids should not be required, two senior midwives discussed how IV fluids may help to keep women progressing on a normal pathway, particularly in cases where the woman has experienced recurrent vomiting and unable to tolerate oral fluids. Um, thought process around the IV fluid administration was also explored in this theme. Um, this is sort of captured in the quote below. So, well, why do we need IV fluids to begin with? Because I think, well, if a woman's in a normal spontaneous labour, she shouldn't need them. So yes, I start to think, okay, she may be not, not on a normal pathway, medically managed, but why does she need them? The third theme to emerge was workplace and professional culture. Midwives identified that decision-making around IV fluids and labour rested largely with midwives. The need for medical consultation and a prescribed order was recognised, but it was common for midwives to report on accepted practices in their individual workplaces where this may be likely to occur in retrospect. Influences around expectations and accepted practice included the indications for IV fluids, workplace culture, midwifery, medical relationships and medical officer availability. For example, when IV fluids were administered for a more routine reason, it was more likely that IV start fluids were to be started by midwives and then formally prescribed by a doctor in retrospect. Another possible reason that IV fluids may be started prior to a medical review included that there was an expectation that IV fluids would already be in progress when a concern arose, with this expectation coming from both senior midwifery staff and our medical colleagues. One midwife spoke about the differences in working in a small rural unit. I've worked in a couple of small units now, and the doctors aren't necessarily present, or if they are, you're often talking in emergency situations, they're just not. You're not going to delay, and you're working with, usually, the senior midwife, who assumes control of the situation, and has enough clinical experience that if she's prompting the administration of fluids, you trust that it's wise judgement. This was also reiterated by a more senior midwife with senior, um, rural experience. Teamwork with our medical colleagues was also raised at various times through the interviews. One senior midwife spoke about how IV fluid practices had changed over time. Initially, you couldn't put IV fluids up because none of the midwives could cannulate. So you had to have a medical person come in and do that. And now everyone, well not everyone, but a lot of midwives can cannulate. And if you can't as a midwife, you'll get your mate up the corridor to put a cannula in to put fluids in. But it's who's running the show, who's in charge here. It becomes a bit of a control thing. Do they instate these fluids or do you instigate these fluids? This, this quote sort of suggests that there may be political components around surrounding IV fluids and labour, with one midwife reporting a disappointment that IV fluids being removed from the birth unit, um, birth unit setting, so birth centre, as it's received out of their scope of practice. Workplace leaders were also identified to influence workplace and professional culture. For instance, where in units where birth workplace leaders were acknowledged, strict monitoring on maternal fluid balance, awareness of complications, proactive education and undertaking of research and or quality improvement projects were reported. The workplace leaders may have been midwives, obstetricians, anaesthetists or managers. 
However, one thing that did stick out was that the wishes of the woman was not a theme that strongly came through. Whilst it was touched on lightly by a couple of midwives, it was a theme that you may have expected to come through in greater depth. This doesn't mean it is missing, but it does raise the questions of whose needs we are meeting as a priority. The fourth theme was foundational knowledge. Midwives reported learning about IV fluids mostly in the clinical environment. Many participants had difficulty recalling if they had ever had formal education around IV fluid administration during labour. Nurse midwives recognised that IV fluid knowledge was expected to be a pre-existing knowledge when they came into midwifery. However, one participant recognised that nursing education does not generally cover IV fluid management in labour and that this contributes to a gap in knowledge. Additionally, midwives reported peer learning as a potential reason for relaxed fluid balance management during labour care. I'm just brainstorming here, but I don't know that we teach our student midwives about the importance of it that well. So whether or not we're just blasé and going from one generation of midwives to the next generation of midwives. The fifth theme explored was perception of risk, and this was both risk for administering IV fluids and risk if you didn't. Midwives reported on possible complications of IV fluids, including fluid overload, hyponatremia, infection, pain, breast edema, and falsely high neonatal birth weights. However, some midwives also recognised that their understanding of potential complications was minimal. The cascade of intervention was brought up with some participants discussing the greater picture, recognising that labour and birth does not occur in isolation and that there can be flow on effects. I've seen women with breastfeeding issues and I know everything we do at that point has a follow on effect. It's easy when you work in a birthing unit to have the baby out and we're all good and off we go to the ward and that's it, on to the next thing. But I think looking at it from a perspective where you think about the longer term impacts of it all this fluid to a woman and what that actually means. Balancing safety and risk was a particular concern for midwives working in rural facilities. Here it may be more routine to err on the side of caution and place an IVC at the commencement of labour or prior to starting the induction process. This was reported to be due to low levels of people available help if an emergency was to occur. In birth units where this was not a concern, midwives reported alternate views, arguing that interventions should only be applied when required, recognising that interventions can carry with them unwanted consequences and they have time and resources to intervene if necessary. The healthy woman was also identified as a reason for a perceived low sense of risk. Midwives reported working primarily with young, healthy women with good hearts that can compensate for extra volume from IV fluids. However, this was recognised that this could contribute to a false sense of security and potentially lead to adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes. Finally, the impact of seminal events was also identified in this theme. Several midwives reported being aware of major clinical incidents relating to IV fluid administration. Mainly these related to women who experienced fluid load or load and acute pulmonary edema. Clinical incidents were recognised to be triggers for clinical practice reviews and increased education. However, it was unclear whether seminal events impacted care and perception of this risk long term. The sixth theme was professional standards and regulations. Midrash reported on a lack of clinical guidelines. This was reported as being odd or unusual. Where guidelines did exist, including IV fluids, they were unusually un non specific. So, all they say with an epidural prior to commencement, secure intravenous access and commit intravenous fluids, that's all they say. So, they don't say what rate or how long to start it or whether you need to do a preload. They just don't say it. They just say have access and fluid running, but that's really vague. So, whereas everything else, like five minute leave BP for 15 minutes, other parts of that guideline are really specific because I don't think we have good quality evidence on it. The lack of clinical guidelines likely promotes variations in clinical practice. Additionally, it does not appear to stop us from referring to guidelines that do not exist. For example, APP, or as per policy, policy, was commonly reported as a way medical officers prescribe the rate for IV fluids during labour, despite the lack of policy to refer to. Several midwives also discussed awareness of lack of evidence and identified the need for greater evidence and clinical guidelines to help guide safe practice. In relation to documentation, the monitoring and documentation of maternal fluid balance was recognised to be important. However, in some interviews, just how important was recognised by the midwives in the later stages of the interview after they had the opportunity to discuss and reflect. The most frequent point made about the importance of monitoring maternal fluid balance was that the general we don't know who it will be important for until it is too late. I think we generally have a healthy cohort of women that we're caring for. So it's only really when things go badly wrong that the importance of this kind of stuff is highlighted. So I think there's a little bit of apathy about keeping track of all that. To emphasize this, one of the midwives told us a story about a case where she had a woman with undiagnosed gestational hypertension that turned into postpartum preeclampsia. The woman ended up in ICU with pulmonary edema. She was so unwell, and when they looked back, they were unable to determine what her output had been in labor. 
According to the partygram and the fluid balance chart, she basically hadn't passed urine for about 12 hours. So they decided that she was dehydrated and had given her some fluids. The midwife reported that was a really long labour, pumping in fluids, 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 and more fluids. And this resulted in the woman ending up critically unwell. The final theme identified barriers to fluid balance documentation. It was reported in the interviews that the fluid balance charts were seen as a low priority. Midwives were reported forgetting to document it and that it just simply wasn't a habit to complete. Competing priorities and ease of access to doc document was brought up by several midwives. However, one midwife reported that these reasons are not enough to justify why fluid balance charts are poorly filled out generally. I don't think it's busy enough all the time to explain why they're so poorly filled out generally. Whenever we're looking at them in clinical issues or doing audits, and that's just not in midwifery, it's across the board, by the way. But yes, I think business and acuity is one of the barriers, but I think there's also a bit of apathy towards the importance of it in midwifery. But what does all this add up to? Well, before I finish, I do just want to leave you with one last quote. I think it is one of the most poorly managed aspects of intrapartum care, and I've always thought that. And I've always, in previous roles, wanted to find good evidence, and there isn't any. And it's been really curious to me how, I, when I go from facility to facility, everyone has different practices and never really understands why they do it. So, in conclusion, this is an important area that needs further research. Midwives are integral to the administration of IV fluids and labour, and therefore our involvement in research on long time and medical colleagues is important to help ensure we provide the best possible care to our women and birthing people. From my PhD so far, I have established that there is a wide variety in clinical practice and that midwives recognise there is both room and need for improvement. Additionally, the lack of evidence in clinical guidelines is a barrier. Improved fluid and balance documentation is one that we could help us to improve knowledge around this practice. With more accurate documentation, we'll be able to increase our knowledge of current practices and have a better understanding of what research could help us to provide safe holistic care. For this to occur, addressing barriers such as lack of education and promoting facilitators such as ease of access will be important for this to occur. With further research in mind, it is hoped that the third stage of my PhD will be a cohort study examining maternal ne ne neonatal outcomes of IV fluid administration and labour. I look forward to be able to bring this knowledge to you in the near future. I would like to acknowledge my MPhil supervisors, Professor Sally Tracy and Dr. Donna Hart, and my PhD supervisors, Professor Julie List, Dr. Brad DeVeers, and Dr. Heather Shepherd, for their support so far. Before I finish and hand over back to Hazel, I would like the opportunity, though, to ask you guys some questions, if that's okay, um, preferably answering the chat box. So my first question to you is that when you are documenting IV fluids, um, administration labour, where do you actually document? So yeah, I'll just repeat the question. So yeah, when you're giving IV fluids and labour, where do you actually document the IV fluid administration? So whether it's a maternal fluid balance chart. So we have a couple of answers here. We've got the EMR, the electronic maternal record, um, medication chart in the body of the notes. So maybe progress notes. Yeah, and while you're doing... Yeah, while you're doing that, the other question, I do have a question, is that if you had to pick one spot to record where you write about IV fluids or record IV fluids, where would that be in the maternal records? So if you're choosing only one area that you think it should be, like yeah. where, should that, where should that be? Okay, so other areas that have been noted for um, for writing them is on the partogram, um, on the fluid orders, uh, CTG, um, fluid balance chart, medication charts. Um, but now for this next question, we've got uh, on the partogram in the e-maternity, if they're using the electronic version. Orders. There's a variety, isn't there, Belle? Yeah. The nurse's flow chart. The CTG. I suppose this also reflects that some of us are still paper and some of us are moving into electronic. Yes, and that would be very that would be varied across country as well as across um, across nations. Yeah, and also locations, so whether home or in hospital yeah. or birth yeah. centre. Yeah. 
to uh, Rachel also used to use used to write rate per mil type of fluid in half hourly notes. Uh, Lucy's got an electronic um, fluid balance chart and fluid orders. It's a real variety, isn't it? Yeah. And why the last people are just sort of typing up, it's, my last question is more of a curiosity um, and whether you can actually help me. So I'm actually looking to see if anyone is aware of any specific guidelines relating to IV fluids in your area. So if you do have any, my contact details are on this last slide um, or you can contact in the chat. But that is my last question. It's been great to have you, but I'll hand it back over to Hazel to see if there's any questions. Sure, so if you do have any policies or guidelines that you're aware of, maybe take a screenshot now um, so that you can email them to Belle um, because she'd really like to have a look at them. Um, Rachel's saying here, basically anywhere you can, it's something going into the body, therefore extremely important to document, absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, some, some wonderful presentation there. Now, I didn't see too many questions. If you do have a question for Belle, we've got the time to be able to really explore this. Um, so if you have any questions that you could pop in the chat um, or you want to ask, then please let us know. Um, Hi, Hazel, it's Nicole. Hi, everybody. There were a couple of um, questions during the conference, during the presentation. Um, I just wanted to point out, Lucy Sutherland, you mentioned that you are now told not to preload prior to, um, with our vehicles, prior to giving an epidural. And I was just wondering, what's your experience um, of the incidence of um, fetal bradycardia with that? And is that mainly for women who will have a um, preeclampsia? So what's the question for Belle then from that? So for Bell, yes. So Bell, have you have you um, or did you find out anything about the preloading using fluid for preloading and whether that impacted um, fetal heart rates? Yeah, so preloading, um, I'm aware that other people are looking into it, so I'm looking more into general IV fluid use as opposed to specifically preload. But I'm aware that it is sort of an issue of contention. Megan's just got a question here. It is known how is it known how IV fluids cause breast edema, also the effect on baby weight? Yep. So I believe there's a couple of studies out of Canada that have looked at that. Um, so I'm I'm not sure if we have strong evidence, but it's one of those things that could make sense. And I believe that people around the world are looking into it. it certainly seems like this is a, a a topic that needs further further evidence um and you know, more information more research red is saying that she'd be curious to see how many babies lose more than 10 percent fluid 10 percent weight with all this fluid um because obviously that can then be uh that can be quite a difficult thing to then manage isn't it if there is that 10 percent loss of weight did you did you read anything or know anything about that bell I know a little bit there, and it was brought up by most of the midwives in the study as part of one of the sort of cascade of interventions. So if IV fluids do contribute to a greater birth weight of the baby, are we actually pushing babies over that 10% threshold that we have here in Australia? So are they more likely to need, require formula? Um, are we also affecting their breastfeeding? So is it a double barrel of are we causing breastfeeding problems and also having babies with false birth, high birth weights? So it's definitely an area that requires looking into. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rachel's saying evidence-based birth, so that's that website um, about evidence-based birth discusses some of that research as well. So that might be something for people to to go and have a look at. Um, but yeah, so we're really setting up um, setting up women and then babies to have have issues with breastfeeding because of this uh, uh, extra weight that could be um, could be on women and that, on babies that could they they, they can then lose. Uh, now, Cecilia earlier, Cecilia earlier was saying that, interestingly, that IV fluids weren't allowed in birth centres uh, that, that you mentioned, because uh, you, you did mention that in the presentation, that um, one of the themes that came out was that IV fluids were removed from birth centres. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, Belle? 
Um, so I don't, I'm not too familiar with that, but it was one of the birth centre midwives um, saying that they used to give IV fluids when it became necessary to help sort of help keep a woman there. So for example, vomiting. So nothing too sort of serious or concerning, but maybe like a litre of fluids if someone wasn't able to tolerate oral fluids just to help keep them hydrated. And so they didn't require transfer to the delivery suite. And this was to help in keeping with what the woman's wishes want, what they wanted. They wanted to be in the birth centre and not the um, the birthing unit. Um, so it's, it's interesting to say that it also happened in other parts um, as well as in so Australia. So Belle, were you saying then that it was then removed, the IV fluids were then removed from the birthing centre so they could no longer do that? It was recognised as, it's, 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 it was basically recognised that midwives are not able to prescribe IV fluids. So right. if IV fluids are giving area, yeah. they had them, they were using them, but then it was identified that they can't prescribe them, so therefore they shouldn't be using them in that inv in that environment. Is that what that you're saying? Yeah. So it's it's being aware that we actually do need prescribed order. Um, I imagine some places may actually have standing orders to allow midwives in specific situations um, to administer IV fluids, but I believe that wasn't the case for that specific birth centre. Yeah, absolutely. It would depend on the on on what the midwives can do. So Cecilia is saying, you know, in in uh, in Canada, midwives can use IVs at home births mostly to administer antibiotics for GB prophylaxis or other postpartum hemorrhage, butyrotonics, and most midwives un attend uncomplicated births in hospitals without citing an IV line. Certainly a home birth in Australia, um, you, ha you have to be an endorsed midwife, which does give you endorsement for prescribing. So if you really needed to, uh, you could use IV fluids and you could prescribe that um, yourself. So that's a bit of a difference from um, home to hospital there. Not that I think it would be used very, very often at all, but certainly maybe in the treatment of um, of PPH, for example. Yeah. Nicole, do you have any other questions there? I've just noticed Lucy's comments, um, just she's typing in now. So yes, Lucy, so Lucy's sort of writing about that. She's noticed that when she's changed facilities or changed states, perhaps, um, that there is a difference between fluids um, being titrated carefully and now being running more freely. And so that was definitely something that midwives had work in various facilities um, or various states had noticed that sort of everywhere they go was a little bit different. Yeah, that's challenging then, isn't it? Because then that also then shows that, you know, maybe this is an area that is more based on behaviour and tradition um, than evidence. Um, and best practice because, you know, wherever the tradition is in that particular unit, that is what is happening. Um, so, yeah, certainly looking at this is this is potentially something that really needs to be brought into the into the evidence based arena um, to really be thinking, why are we doing this and is it necessary? And so Lorraine saying when the premise is based on a just so story, then no wonder there is so much contradictory practice. That's right. And we just do it because we all, we've always done it, then we've always done it a little bit differently in each place. It is interesting. One of the things I discovered during a literature review and sort of going back to where Ivy Fluid started, there was an obstetric textbook, which I can't remember when it was from, but in the sort of guide about giving Ivy Fluids, the instructions was, quote, say, try 500 mils or try 1,000 mils. So it wasn't like we have evidence for A, B and C. It was, say, try this, see if it works. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. And I think also some of it probably stems from, um, you know, the need to be doing something, you know, that, that feel that we can never just watchfully wait and see what happens. We have to kind of be active um, and, you know, we can actively put in a, an IV cannula, we can actively get the fluids going, we can actively then watch it uh, and monitor it rather than actually just sitting and waiting and watching. And we can understand why that occurs. Yes. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, we might go through the, the final slides. Um, Belle, if you just want to... Oh, no, that's okay. I can do that. I'm just going to make Nicole, Nicole the presenter so that Nicole's able to go through those. Um, final slides, but thank you for the really interesting presentation, Belle. I just think it's something that is uh, showing that there's a real gap um, and a diversity of practice. So a really important topic and well done on, on one of your earliest presentations and coming and doing that 
here for us here at the at the VIDM. It's a great platform to tell us about your PhD work. It's certainly something in my masters and PhD that I really loved coming into VIDM and sharing my sharing my initial findings. So um, hopefully you'll come back and you'll tell us about uh, your the next lot of findings from as your PhD progresses into different stages.